morning. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Great. All right. We'll jump right in. It's right, right at 9 o'clock. Uh, perhaps it's appropriate to start with some introductions. My name is Murad Basaria, and I have been involved with ammonia handling packages for over 18 years. I have a degree in chemical engineering, and in my career spanning about 28 years, I worked in the chemical, oil and gas, and power industry. Today, uh, we would like to keep this presentation about 30 minutes. The goal is to give an overview of our organization and about the SCR business and NOx abatement in general. We will cover topics such as NOx in Brazil, the design issues and components of the SCR system, selective catalytic reduction system, and then touch on the different reagents used in the process and discuss how modularizing of the reagents helps in overall cost and project schedule. We will have a Q&A or question and answer session at the end of the presentation, so I respectfully request that the uh, participants to submit questions in the sidebar or ask your question during the Q&A section. IFS, or Integrated Flow Solutions, is based out of Tyler, Texas, which is about 160 kilometers east of Dallas, Texas. We pride ourselves on being an organization that has capability to design, engineer, and produce both process and rotating equipment. We have almost 12,000 square meters of covered facilities, which include engineering, design, welding, painting, warehousing, testing, and assembly. Our shops are equipped with 18 overhead cranes, each with a 26-foot hook height. In our heavy assembly shop, there are two cranes, each capable of lifting 25 tons, or 50,000 kilograms. When we receive an RFQ, our team reviews the requirements and develops a technical commercial proposal that forms the basis for further discussion with client using Aspen HISIS, which are industry proven simulation software uh, design, hence providing an alternative to the client. Our goal is to be competitive and win the business with creative solutions. After we have Awarded the project, Detail Engineering starts, which allows us to provide detailed drawings and documents to the client for approval. Once the process is completed, our purchasing begins, followed by fabrication, assembly, testing, and final product acceptance by client. After shipping preparation, the packages are delivered to the client who has the option of shipping to the site themselves or we can provide this service. Our site service and aftermarket support is provided by our internal site support team. Uh, I'd like to throw the slide up there just to show that we have been active in Brazil and been doing business for the past 20 years. As you can see, we have executed several spec-driven projects in Brazil, and we are excited about the opportunity presented to us to bring our ammonia handling equipment experience to this, uh, to this market. In addition to ammonia handling packages that we specialize in the power plant, the ammonia packages are the unloading, the storage, which are these two uh, storage tanks, this is an anhydrous ammonia storage, high pressure, aqua ammonia storage, low pressure, uh, both in carbon and stainless steel. 
ammonia flow control skids. We also offer other packages for the power business, which include fuel handling, both gas and liquid fuel handling, chemical injection, and uh, water packages for uh, boiler feed water. Why should we control NOx? So, air is 79% nitrogen and over 20% oxygen. Both these are diatomic gases. When we burn fuel, the nitrogen gas breaks into single nitrogen atom, which react with oxygen to form NOx. High amounts of NOx is produced by combustion. The technology for NOx abatement has improved exponentially in the ten, last 10 years, but it's been around for oh, over 50 years now. And there have been advancements through both field experience and catalyst technology, which have helped drive down cost and schedule for the NOx reduction abatement process. Highlighting the basis for NOx, first off, NOx is a precursor to acid rain. What that simply means is that NOx, when it comes in contact with water, produces nitric acid. And this acid rains down in a diluted form, which has adverse effect on the ground, such as your drinking water and food, and causes damage to living cells, resulting in disease and loss of life. Brazil has enacted legislation to curb and control NOx after studying the effects of NOx on human, animals, and plants. Release of NOx has been on the rise as economies have grown, leading to expansion in the power generation of other industries. The uh, prolonged exposure to NOx can result in permanent damage to living organisms. Exposure to NOx has been directly responsible for 10,000 deaths, sorry, 100,000 deaths in the span of five years, not to mention long-term chronic illness, including cancer and other diseases for a huge population segment. Brazil, uh, the pollutants, as you can see in the picture, Hello, we can't hear you, we, we just uh, hear a noise.
Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Great. Echo? Okay, we'll, we'll continue. I regret we had this little technical issue, and I, then I stopped on this slide here. Okay. As we can like the legislation to curb and control NOx after studying the effects of NOx on human, animals, and plants, release of NOx has been on the rise as economies have grown, leading to expansion of power generation of the industry. NOx can result in permanent damage to living organisms. Years. Eleven. To mention long term chronic illness, including cancer for a huge segment of the population. <laughs> SCR provides the largest single NOx removal capabilities of any system. Up to 95% NOx removal efficiency can be achieved. It's a uh, relatively simple process, and fortunately for us, there have been several successful operating systems whose experience we can use and help the technology advance. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this slide to highlight the issue with the SCR design. The SCR considerations are gas flow rate. A, it's, it's, it's critical that the gas flow rate is in a band and, and the turn down is limited. Otherwise, the uh, low velocity or the high velocity both could cause issues. Low velocity would be, would, would not allow proper mixing and would not result in the NOx abatement efficiency that we're looking for. And high velocity, of course, would have mechanical or issues with degradation of the system. Uh, the gas temperature is another consideration. The optimal temperature is about 650F, which is typically, what, 340C. But the range is, is somewhere up 800F. Uh, above the temperature, you, you, we run into issues of ammonium salts that are produced, which could block uh, the catalyst pores and, and reduce the efficiency of the catalyst itself. Below 450F, the, the uh, Temperature is not hot enough for the reaction to take place. You've got you're going back to from a stable state to an unstable state, and therefore you have to have some some higher temperatures for the reaction to take place. And that's why you have separate duct burner uh, in the uh, HERSIC for SCR for this SCR. Uh, reaction. If, if it gets too cold, then you've got to heat the hersig up so that you get the temperature for the SCR to the, the catalyst re re reaction to take, uh, take place. Catalyst activity is a measure of the NOx production reaction rate, and it's a function of many variables, uh, including catalyst composition, structure, diffusion rate, 
mass transfer rates, and gas composition. The uh, catalyst deactivation is caused by several things, including poisoning of the active sites, uh, thermal sintering of active sites. destroy or, or reduce the efficiency of the catalyst, destroy portions of the catalyst. The other thing I want to discuss quickly is the ammonia slip. Uh, typically, if you have too high a, an ammonia flow, you could slip to the system and you're not, you, not only it's wastage of ammonia, you're not getting the best effect for uh, the reaction. Uh, pressure drop obviously is a big effect if, if the system which includes the duct work and the entire catalyst and the way the catalyst laid out is not designed properly and you have a higher pressure drop which could you know result in the exhaust gas to have a higher pressure drop and back up the, the exhaust gas and the efficiency uh, obviously goes down. Uh, one of the issues with catalyst life is uh, is degradation over time. This could be a combination of mechanical, thermal, or even poisoning and plugging of the uh, catalyst. Fouling is prevalent in industry applications such as coal-fired power plants. The uh, the sulfur can produce salts, resulting in plugging of the pores of the reactor, hence reduce effective sites for the reaction of NOx conversion to take place. I, I, I see that uh, there are still some issues with people not able to see my screen or hear me. Uh, can I get a response from participants? Everybody can hear me or see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. I had a note up here saying that uh, one of the participants had trouble. Anyhow. Yeah, there are some people that they cannot hear you. That's okay. Okay. IFS uh, designs the auxiliary ammonia handling skits, which are the storage and vaporizer forwarding accumulator and the uh, ammonia flow control skids uh, which feed the ammonia and air into the ductwork for reaction uh, on the SCR or the, the, the catalyst sites. There are essentially three reagents which is which are anhydrous ammonia, which is essentially all ammonia and very little water. Uh, aqua ammonia, which is diluted, anhydrous ammonia is hazardous, and 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 therefore aqua ammonia, which is diluted in a U2A, which is a urea system, which uh, you can transport safely urea and then convert that to a, a solution of ammonia, C2, and water, which is uh, then fed to a ammonia flow control skid, which feeds into the ductwork into the uh, SCR system. The ammonia, hydrous ammonia, is the optimal solution 
as far as cost, both operating and capital costs, but it has its drawbacks. It's uh, hazardous and toxic, and accidental release could have effects on human life and animal life. There have been incidents where ammonia release has caused deaths. Uh, for this purpose, legislation is in highly populated areas, uh, transportation in highly populated areas restricted and government agency require uh, documents to, for, for their uh, transport. The ammonia uh, storage and forwarding package for a and how this ammonia system comprises of ASME pressure vessel, which is this uh, large holding tank, uh, heaters, instrumentation, and piping. And how ammonia has a vapor pressure of about 60 psi g at 60 f. Therefore, the heaters are typically used when ambient pressure drop to the point that sufficient pressure is not available, but at high temperature. The ammonia is has enough pressure to be regulated pressure reducing valve and causes the vapor to slightly superheat and avoid condensation that's moved out to the ammonia flow control skid. The during cooler temperatures when you don't have enough heat available for the ammonia to vaporize itself. The ammonia flow, the, the, the liquid ammonia flows to the heater. It's, it's, a, it's a thermosiphon effect. It's a loop. It goes from the heaters. It, it, it runs the liquid line, goes to the heater, and they're 200% heaters, and that the reason is for redundancy. And it feeds back into the tank itself, and the vapors are taken off the top, go through a pressure reduction, and then off to the, to the process. Aqueous ammonia is, is more commonly used as a reagent because of the safety factor. It's uh, diluted ammonia. The capital and operating costs are higher because you're really adding water, which really doesn't do much for NOx abatement. Uh, and then the transportation, you're transporting a lot of water with a little bit of ammonia. And also, it requires more energy, whether it be steam or electric power, to convert the liquid to gas for mixing with air. Uh, it's not as regulated, and there are very few rules for handling ammonia, uh, but it, it's coming to a point where, where the government's getting more interested in, in putting in legislation for more regulation for uh, aqu aqueous ammonia. So, to transport aqueous ammonia, typically the best method is to use pumps, and it, it's, e, it's, an, it's a lot easier to pump aqueous ammonia than to pump anhydrous because anhydrous is real volatile, has a lower vapor pressure, uh, can lead to issues with uh, flashing. But aqueous ammonia, because of adding the water, it's more stable for, for pumping purposes. The safe alternative to hazardous transport and bulk storage of either anhydrous or aqueous ammonia is solid urea. And this urea is available in granular form, which allows for easy transport and storage. When urea is hydrolyzed with steam, it produces ammonia and CO2, and the outlet of the of the process is a 15 to 18 percent ammonia, 25 percent CO2, and the remaining is we're in the form of steam. This is a picture of a typical ammonia urea to ammonia process. You bring urea in a truck, you dissolve it, you got the pumps, and that feeds back into a uh, hydrolyzer into solution and then 
it goes off to the AFCU to be fed into the network for, for the SCRs. Whether it's aqueous and hydrous or the product from a urea dissolver, they all need to be mixed with carrier gas for distribution in the uh, SCR ductwork. Essentially, the ammonia flow control system comprises of two lines. One is the ammonia feed line, which is filtered, measured, and controlled prior to mixing. The second is the carrier gas. This could be either ambient air or flue gas to vaporize the, the ammonia. So here's a simplistic PFD process flow diagram of a ammonia mixing skid. So you've got the ammonia inlet, you've got a, this is typically a small line anywhere from half inch to, you know, one and a half inch and got a filter, DP cell across it, pressure reduction, measurement, uh, emergency shutdown, control that gets fed into a mixing chamber. And these blowers, the 200% blowers for redundancy, so if one goes out, you've got the other spare, these blowers feed, take and air, which is just, just regular ambient air, uh, measure it, heat it up in a heater or a steam heater, and that heat is what vaporizes the aqueous ammonia. So now you have a mixture of air and aqueous ammonia and water, quite a bit of water, that uh, gets moved up to the lances where it's injected into the ductwork. Uh, a, um, a, a typical Pump package has 200% pumps, instrumentation valves, controls, skid mounted that would take the product from storage tank to the ammonia flow control skid. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, anhydrous ammonia are, are quite a bit different than aqueous ammonia. Yes, you can pump anhydrous ammonia, but the pumping technology is different. Uh, ammonia pumps usually have a single impeller and then several stages of vein impellers to build the pressure. So you, you just can't take it up one stage because you start, start having issues with NPSH, which is net, net positive suction head. Aquas ammonia is much easier to pump, and typically a single stage pump can do the job. Uh, in some applications, electric heater is used to heat the anhydrous ammonia inside a pressure vessel, and this heat produces the pressure for the anhydrous ammonia to be pushed out as a saturated liquid or as a saturated gas from the pressure vessel out to the process. Ammonia storage packages, uh, they're, they're built to SME Section 8 Division 1 pressure vessels. You've got the 19 and 25, 29% aqueous ammonia storage have about free five percent free volume. There are really no written regulations. And how does ammonia storage in a pressure vessel requires fifteen percent of free volume is regulated by GC two point one, which is used to be the NCK sixty one one standard. There are provisions to store large amounts of anhydrous ammonia in atmospheric vessels, but that and how does ammonia needs to be chilled to below its vapor pressure uh, so that you can have, you can use a, it's more economical to, to, to chill and store than to have, you know, these high pressure uh, tanks. Uh, typically, a customer requires the use of either carb steel or stainless steel tanks for aqueous ammonia, but for anhydrous ammonia, since it has to be post-well heat treated, which is a mandate by GC 2.1, the design pressure is 250 PSIG for anhydrous ammonia and about 50 PSIG for a horizontal uh, aqueous ammonia tank. There are some 
more requirements for anhydrous ammonia, such as redundancy for relief valves and uh, having relief valves between any two points could be blocked, like two valves. Uh, the requirements are to provide a relief valve, and the valves, the, the block valves themselves have to be a special design so that it has a cavity to vent out any ammonia that's blocked into the into the ball of the ball valve. And, and you know, if, you, if your temperature goes up, the pressure goes up, and that could be uh, could be an issue. Uh, in addition to ammonia and equipment, IFS offers packages in the power plant. And this slide is a little busy slide, but if you uh, notice, there are two colors. One is the bronze or, or the golden color, and, and the other ones are in black. The skids that are in black are what IFS can can support and, and provide. Typically, the bronze are the big items such as the cooling tower, the turbine itself, the switch gear, the HERSIG, uh, and, and you know those are specialty items that we don't get involved. But the equipment in in in, in black, such as the fuel uh, system, which is you know supply fuel heating package, heating package, scrubbing, filtering. And of course, the ammonia flow control skids, ammonia pumping packages, boiler feed water pump packages. So, just want to throw that out there to uh, to advise that we are just not limited to ammonia system, but also to other packages, skid mounted packages in the power industry. So, uh, this brings our presentation to a conclusion, and. Uh, I think we're right on target. I regret we had some technical issues uh, earlier where you couldn't hear me. But uh, at this point, we'll be glad to answer any questions. Uh, thank you for your time and participation. Give me a second. Uh, I am trying to just uh, remove the uh, the mute button here. So if in case anybody has a question, please give me a second, please. Sure. All right. I think that. Um, uh, it has been solved. Uh, thank you so much, Murad, for your uh, presentation. I think that uh, it was a great presentation, uh, very informative about uh, the uh, uh, air um, uh, cleaning services and all the equipment that we can provide uh, to our customers in order to make uh, our world a little better. Uh, but I will I would like to open the microphones to anybody who may have any questions. Uh, please uh, feel free to ask uh, to Murat. Okay. Um, thank you, folks. Uh, certainly, we'll we'll entertain any questions uh, via email. Uh, this is our contact information, and if there is a, a request, you can certainly email this presentation uh, to the group also. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Murad. Thank you so much to everybody who attended this, uh, this webinar. We hope to uh, we will be able to have another webinar in the near future with another topic that maybe will be interesting for you. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you.